It is a privilege to be together and to be able to exalt God in song and to spend a month reflecting with our missionaries that come home. Dean, it is a delight to have you here and we have heard from others and to take time as a congregation to take the baton that has been passed to us from the Bible and then throughout history for so many more and to be a church that understands and lives out the great command and the great commission. If you don't know what those are, God willing, by the end of this message, you will. I enjoy watching the Olympics. The committee in France tried to wreck that for me this year with some uh, fairly disgusting things that they did in their opening, although I suppose when the world puts on a celebration, we should not think it will be appropriate. However, I did enjoy swimming especially. We have some very good Canadian swimmers. And I was shocked when our Canadian men won the 4x100 sprint race, the relay race. Did you manage to celebrate that? I was shocked mainly because as sprinters, and we've had some very, very good sprinters in our history, we don't have as many as some of the other countries. In fact, this year, of the very top sprinters in the world, when they lined up on the line to run their race, do you know how many Canadians were with them? None. Our best sprinter, who is a world-class sprinter, he is phenomenal, placed fifth in the semifinal, and that was his best time of the season. The American team is a phenomenal team. They draw from all sorts of great sprinters. In fact, just to make the American team is incredible. And they have on their team probably five of the top ten sprinters in the world. And if you wanted to mix into that, the country of Jamaica, they also have incredible sprinters. And so when you line up on the line and seek to race this race, it is well, probable that the fastest team that has the fastest runners will win. I was reading an article as I was preparing for this message, and it was an American writing about their Olympic team's debacle. 2016 Olympics disqualified. They passed the baton outside the zone. 2015 Worlds disqualified in the final for passing the baton outside the zone. 2013 Worlds, silver. 2012 Olympics, silver. 2011 Worlds didn't finish in the final after tripping from interaction with an adjacent runner. 2009 Worlds disqualified in heats for passing the baton outside the zone. And I could continue. I suppose this just means that Americans should become Canadian, right? <laughs> what it means is that there are sometimes in a race... Other things that go on that make the best team win, that's Canada, if you're wondering, not necessarily the best individual sprinters. Well, we as God's people are a part of a team. It's a team that has existed ever since Jesus started to build his church. I suppose we could even stretch farther back than that in terms of the promise of God. But it's a team where we are to take the baton that those who have gone before us pass to us and carry on in a missional passion to accomplish what God desires. Where did this missional passion for the church begin? Where was the first sprint, as it were, start to take place, or I suppose maybe a marathon as we're 2,000 years or so into this, where did it start? And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope that you do, I think perhaps not where it started, but the best picture of that first initial mission's passion is found in the book of Acts, and really, I suppose, in the book of Acts chapter 13. So Acts 13, we're going to look at verses 1 to 4, where we find a prayer meeting that changed the world. As you turn there in your Bibles, understand the book of Acts really is an overflow of the mission of Jesus and his great commission to his disciples, where he said, make, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
There's a transition and the Holy Spirit comes and empowers the disciples of Jesus so that they can live as witnesses. They can live on mission. Acts 1 verse 8, this whole idea of to go and to wait and to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and then to live on mission for Jesus. And in Acts 1.8, we find it's to be in their local area, their sphere of influence. It's to be in their greater sphere of influence, their country, or I suppose adjacent countries for them. For us, I would maybe argue the greater Vancouver area, maybe even B.C. and Canada. And to the outermost parts of the world. Now, it's amazing as the early church started to grow, and the book of Acts gives us really the history of what the Holy Spirit did to build the church. As the church starts to grow, it's it's reaching people, and thousands are coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And this, this small little start where we found the crucifixion of the Messiah and his resurrection, and really you had 11 disciples left and some women, I suppose, more faithful than those 11 disciples. Now, this on fire band of disciples who are seeking to live for the glory of God and they're planting churches. In Acts 11, there's a church planted in Antioch and it's a a good church, in fact, a healthy church and we'll discover this morning a a sending church. They're taking the baton and they're learning and, and growing and seeking to be all that Jesus wants them to be. The baton is being passed. I suppose as we start to try to understand this passage in the context of Acts, I would also like us to understand and apply it in the context of our own lives. I was raised in a church that believed in the social gospel perhaps more than the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of redemption. But early on in our time, Lori and I picked another church, and it was a a church that was known actually with the word missionary in its title. It was a missions church and very passionate about missions all over the globe. And yet, if you studied this denomination now, you would discover that much of its missions passion has been, well, at least tempered. Canada, which used to be a strong sending nation, is perhaps now, in terms of an understanding of global missions, a receiving nation. And I would argue perhaps even more substantially problematic is that most people in Canada, and it's a very small percentage now who would name the name of Jesus in terms of their passion to follow him, or what I would define as gospel-oriented Christians, the vast majority of those are not engaged in terms of reaching or I suppose living on mission, if we want to keep the language consistent, in their own communities. So what has been planted as, and then the baton being passed over the years, not only biblically, but also in terms of to us from other churches and other missionaries and other mission organizations, and really the whole understanding from Jesus of how we're to live on mission for him, I think in some ways Canada has dropped the baton. Perhaps even if you're here today and not living on mission for Jesus, you have as well. So my goal today will be twofold, to understand what's going on in terms of the global impact of this prayer meeting in Acts 13, but also, I hope, to impact you so that you will see your own life as one where God has placed you on mission in your sphere of influence and you will surrender to him and you will worship him in such a way with all of your life that you'll impact those in your sphere of influence and then as an overflow of that have a passion to be a part of our church and other churches seeking to have a global impact for the kingdom of Christ. I am concerned that in Canada, what was for some churches a very strong gospel mission where the kingdom of God was being sought with passion has become a place where smaller kingdoms are being built and defended. Politics or passion for other things, distractions have taken us away from what Jesus has said should be at least one of the two most important things that define who we are as individuals and then as a church. The great command. Clearly, this call to live in an all-defining relationship with Jesus, to love him with all that we are and all that we have, all defining and to love our neighbors as ourselves. the great commission to live on mission for him, to 
truly see our own lives as not only driven and defined by that love relationship, but overflowing and seeking to influence those that God has placed around us, not only in our sphere of influence, but all around the world with the glory of the good news of Jesus. So if you are not living on mission or engaged with those around the world who are not living on mission, I hope that the text that we cover today in terms of its historical context in the book of Acts, the first great missionary journey being the overflow of this prayer meeting, will not only allow you to rejoice in the goodness of God in history, but allow you to pick up the baton from those who have gone before us and run the race that God has placed before you. Acts 13. Now, there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mannion, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. We won't spend a lot of time here if we were preaching through the book of Acts. I love how culturally expansive the name of those people are. You find those who clearly are influential politically. You find those who are, well, Simon the Black, perhaps the one who was uh, influential in terms of carrying the cross of Jesus, but here his color on display, if you understand where he would have come from. Uh, probably the second one listed there, the third one listed there also would have been a person of color, different than someone from the Middle East. I think you see already in the beginning of the church the global passion that this Jew Jesus had for seeing the gospel impact, and we'll see as an overflow of this, even those of us with European descent. I love the idea of this being so multi-ethnic and passionate, this overflow of God's desire for a global impact. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This is a historical event. This is happening in a local church. They're seeking God so strongly that the overflow of that is this longing to have their entire lives aligned with what he desires and they're listening passionately for what he would say to them. Uh, for us, as we'll see as we study this, this means a longing to be word-saturated. This means a longing to say, Lord Jesus, you can have every breath that I take. My passion will be for you. This, this is what I long for and to be a part of a healthy community that does the same, that, that interacts with life from your perspective. Antioch, really the first beachhead of Christianity in the ancient world, and the death of Stephen brought this persecution and the persecution brought a scattering, and as the Christians were scattered because they were frightened to death of what the government would do for them, they carried the gospel with them. In fact, if we were to look at the Great Commission, it's not a command to go. It's an assumption. While you're going, carry with you as your deepest passion the, the overflow of what defines you, the, the glory and richness of what Jesus has done for you. Carry that as an all-defining thing. And so when you're scattered, in this case, from persecution, carry the gospel with you. Don't be ashamed of that gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation, first to the Jew, and then the Gentile, then the whole world. And so these scattered disciples carried with them this passion for Jesus, this willingness to, to suffer for him, this, this full surrender. And then these churches being planted, Antioch being the one specifically we're looking at now, become a great commission people. So they're praying, they're worshiping, they're longing for God to move in their midst and to speak to them. And this is a prayer meeting that changed the world. One of my favorite scholars on this chapter in the Bible says, and he uses his own church, I'll use ours. If this prayer meeting hadn't taken place, if this church wasn't who they had become because of their passion for Jesus, then Cloverdale Baptist Church would not exist now, I suppose that's overselling the impact of one prayer meeting and underselling the sovereignty of God. But I would say this. God chose to use these people to begin what has become a worldwide passionate impact for the glory of God. 
So if we can see somehow what impacted them to be this kind of people, then I think we can, at least I hope, catch some of this passion and and some of this desire, and we can become what what seems to be missing in so many churches in Canada, a missionally engaged church, and more and more so. I mean, I suppose to some degree we do well as a church. We have a number of missionaries we support. We have sent some of our very own, some of our best. Dean, that would include you. But I think... There is much more that God desires for us and much more from us as we engage in our own communities and in our own world. So let's track with them and say, in this historical narrative of what occurred, what can we learn from it so that we can then become more and more who God desires us to be as a missionally engaged congregation, individuals and corporately? The first thing I think we notice is that they were surrendered. They were surrendered. What does that mean? Well, I suppose it just means that they understood that Jesus Christ is Lord. But let's see how we see it in this particular passage. Now, there were in the church this gathering. It's not a building. Remember, it's a gathering of believers at Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, while they were fully engaged in terms of surrender to God. Now, now please hear, sometimes when we read the word worship, we think of singing or songs, and it includes that. But if that's all you have in terms of your surrender to God, then you do not understand or know the God of the Bible. Romans 12, 1 to 2 maybe says this more clearly, but... Here, the word for worship, a little adjustment from this word in our text, but the idea is this full surrender, this life lived, devoted to God, this willingness to say, God, where you send, I will go. What you command, I will do. I will live my life defined by my love for you. I suppose we would argue this is the great command. We're to love the Lord with all that we have and all that we are. See, if the mercy of God, Romans 12, 1, has impacted us, then we will offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Worship in Acts 13 is not just singing and praising and listening to the word of God. It's a passionate, inside-out devotion to God that is saying, God, my life is yours. When you read the word worship here, don't think just in terms of our own services, although I think those are important. Think more than that. This is an all-in devotion. Oh, God, my life is yours. I want to be driven and defined by my relationship with you. I am fully and completely devoted to you. Yes, it would have included the gathering of men and women and children and the studying of God's word and its preaching and the passion to overflow and, and songs and prayer, but it included being sent into the world as we will see. They were fasting. Some people see fasting as a way to manipulate God, and they are wrong. Fasting is something that is given to us to show our longing for God to move. Often in the Old Testament, it was this this longing, this overwhelming sense of of grief, and oh God, if you could speak into this situation, it's it's a longing for deeper intimacy with God and wider impact for his glory. They're they're saying to God, we we want you more than food. We we want your will more than anything else. We want to set aside our desires to eat or to drink or, or anything else to show that our deepest desire is to live our lives to the praise of your glorious grace. This is a spiritually minded, passionate church. See, for them, this relationship with Jesus was not something of convenience but it was a compelling love that they acknowledged not only that God is real and relevant, but that he desires and demands radical devotion to the praise of his glorious grace. They knew the teachings of Jesus. They longed to know them more. And so they gathered in humble, full surrender. I wonder if perhaps one of the reasons why Canada 
and churches in Canada have become more concerned about politics or the social gospel is because we have lost our sense of full surrender. I wonder if you looked at your own life and you were to say, okay, how am I doing at sharing the gospel with my sphere of influence? How, how am I doing about knowing that God has placed me on mission where I'm at? I, I wonder if one of the reasons why some of us, if not the majority of us, would say I need to do more, I wonder if the reason for that might be that instead of surrendering everything that we are and everything that we have to God in worship, we make demands on him or are distracted by the world and so we live average, normal, not deeply worshipful lives. This church was surrendered. Secondly, and I suppose they're deeply interconnected, they were spirit-led. Deeply interconnected, what I mean by that is that we choose to surrender and it's as we choose God is at work in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure. God's spirit not only causes us to be surrendered or to choose to surrender, but also works in us so that this becomes the pattern of our lives. While they were worshiping and fasting, worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we would find the Holy Spirit here speaking? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we prayed and all of a sudden this big voice de declared over the, the mic and all of a sudden you didn't hear Rob's voice, you heard God's. Wouldn't that be amazing? Brothers and sisters, we have something better than they did in this prayer meeting. We have the complete word of God. And every time we read the scriptures and understand them in terms of their context and seek to apply them, we are hearing from the Spirit. If you want to hear the overt verbal voice of God, read the Bible out loud. See, sometimes in the laziness of our culture, we, we long for something more. And let me say that I do believe that we can get direction from the Holy Spirit in all sorts of different ways. I myself have heard voices at times, responded in humility, and I would even argue that God has worked through perhaps angels, perhaps his Holy Spirit to help me in some very difficult situations. I think God is relational. No, let me restate that. That's way too soft. God is relational. But the only way he speaks with authority is through his word. What that means is, if we want to be spirit-filled, if we want to be spirit-led, it's more than just words, and it's more than just emotions. It's a passion to be word-saturated. See, the fullness of the Spirit, and walking in terms of being word-saturated, Ephesians 4 and 5 and Colossians 3 mirror each other, and they're almost identical in what they say. If you want to be someone who lives in the power of the Spirit, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, you must be someone who hears his voice in the Word of God and responds in obedience. For them, the canon was not complete, and so they listened carefully to some who were able to give suggestions. Not authoritative but hearing and responding. Now, you listen to those of us who preach and teach and you hold us, I hope, in account in terms of what does the word of God actually teach, but we long to be those who truly, truly, not just in word, not just in motion, but are truly spirit-filled. And you say, well, how do we know if we're being spirit-led? How do we know if we're truly spirit-filled? Well, I've already told you, it means you're gonna have a passion for the word of God. You're gonna, you're gonna be word-saturated, but you're also gonna see that your life aligns with the fruit of the spirit. You're going to see a difference in how you live, in the power of the Spirit. In other words, you're saying this, this is not just some religion in name only. This is not just some passionate religious pursuit. Even the Pharisees did that fairly well. It's a, it's a longing to live in this all-defining relationship in the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's this willingness to obey. Oh, brothers and sisters, let us not Long for something that was there when we have something that is so richer and better. 
I'm not arguing that I want you to live a dead biblical life. I'm arguing that the Bible is alive and active. Or I suppose, if you want to use Hebrews for language, it's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I'm arguing if you want to, well, forget me, the Bible would say, if you want to be someone who lives a spiritual life, surrender to God, then you need to be someone who is willing to listen to God and God speaks through his word. I wonder if one of the reasons why the Canadian church is so lacking in a passion for global missions and perhaps so powerless in reaching our communities for Christ is that we spend more time in the world than the word and more time being trained by the spirits of this world than the Holy Spirit. I wonder if you were to look at your own life and your own passions and you're saying, I want to be someone who is missionally minded. I want to be a great command, great commission person. And I want to be a part of a church that's a great command, great commission church. I, I wonder if you would be willing not only to ask the question, am I fully surrendered to the lordship of Jesus? Is my life driven and defined by him in terms of worship, longing to obey him in every step that I take? I I wonder if you would also be willing to long to be spirit-filled, to long to be word obedient, to say, I'm going to spend my time and my treasures and my talents longing to hear from God and to be in the word, listening to the voice of the spirit and seeking to apply that with all of my might. This church in Antioch was surrendered. This church in Antioch was Spirit-filled, they long to hear the voice of God and to obey. And thirdly, this church was sent, sending, and supporting. Sent, they were in the community they were in. They were sending, they supported the worldwide missions that would take place now. And then they supported that missional movement. And it's amazing to watch from this not only the first great missionary journey of Paul, but all world missions we could trace, I suppose, maybe to Jesus' great commission, but for sure to this prayer meeting. I want us to realize that the church was engaged in this. This is not individuals saying, I'm going to go and you need to support. This is the Holy Spirit setting apart those who would go, not just in their own communities, but all over the world. This is the church saying, God, we long to serve you. We long to know you. We long to engage in mission here and in the rest of Vancouver and the rest of BC and the rest of Canada and all over the world. God, we want to hear from you and engage with you so that the richness of your gospel will be global. I wonder sometimes if the comfort of the Canadian church makes us not want to share and engage locally, and then because our resources are tied up here, I wonder if then we don't listen to God who might be sending us globally or calling us to support global missions. I also wonder, just uh, wondering out loud, if it's much easier to give a little money to global missions than it is to engage in the Great Commission in our own lives. See, what this church understood in terms of this exploding impact from 11-week disciples to thousands upon thousands, now millions, billions impacted for the glory of Jesus, what they understood is that every single believer... Everyone who truly knows Jesus, who's surrendered, who's spirit-filled, is called to live on mission. That's the great command flowing over into the great commission. My life driven and defined by Jesus. Now, I'm to, while I'm going, this is to every disciple, not some sort of superset of missionaries and pastors, but every di disciple, while you're going, while you're living, where you are, make disciples of all nations. Meaning, if you know Jesus, he's placed you where you're at in terms of your neighborhood, in terms of your, your friends, in terms of your family, in terms of your workplace and school and all of those things. He's placed you because he wants to use you to help others to believe in Jesus and surrender in terms of 
following and building his kingdom for his glory. See, this is amazing. And this church understood it, not only locally, where their impact was massive, but now globally, where their impact is impacted us. Even now, 2,000 or so years later. This is the amazing thing about serving the God of the Bible. When we surrender, when we're spirit-filled, and we engage on the mission he's given us, he takes us in what little we have to offer, and he blesses it, and he enlarges our impact. I wonder if some of us just feel like, man, we just don't have a lot to offer. And I would say to you, there's a young boy who didn't have a lot to offer. He had a small lunch his mom had made him, and he had been way late and gone to hear a great speaker, and that speaker was amazing. And then some guy named Andrew came to him and said, hey, is there any food? And it's the only food they could find. And they grabbed this little kid, and they brought him to Jesus, and Jesus took this small lunch, and what did he do with it? See, brothers and sisters, when we surrender... And then we're spirit-filled. God takes cracked pots like us in the fullness of his spirit and changes the world. See, sometimes we think, oh, it's just for Paul and Barnabas. They're pretty good. I don't disagree. They took a guy named Mark with them. You probably know this if you trace through the book of Acts. And Mark was a wimp. The going got tough, and if we were to keep reading in Acts 13, what you discover is anybody who wants to live on mission for Jesus will hit conflict, both from the demonic realm and the world around and even the flesh. And Mark was fighting in that battle, and Mark hit those mountains, and he hit the dangers to his own health. Perhaps he was sick, some scholars say, and he, he just full stopped. He went, I'm done. I'm out. I've had enough of this missionary thing. I'm going home to mummy. I'm named after Mark, middle name. And you know what? God took Mark from that broken wimp of a missionary and made him one of the premier servants of Paul near the end of Paul's life. Why don't I tell you that story? Well, simply this. I don't know where you come from today. I, I don't know where you're at. I do know that in Canada, and we're in Canada, that our missionary zeal, our passion for the global missions movement has really started to die. We're a receiving nation now more than a sending nation. At least that's my understanding of the statistics. So we're not in great shape. And I, I think as a church, we do well. We give to missions. I think that's wonderful. But I think we could do a lot more than just giving of our resources. I think we could engage in our own community and world in a way that would blow the doors off this place if we were surrendered and spirit-filled and engaged in this kind of way. So in a month where we're emphasizing world missions and we're bringing our missionaries home, or at least they've come home, I suppose, and it's wonderful to hear what God's doing around the world. And if you stay for lunch, Dean will share with us what God is doing through our prayers and through him and the Ukraine, and what a privilege to be there on the ground in the midst of this battle, correct? You know, it's also a privilege in surrender to God to be where you're at. So I want us to apply this historical narrative prayer meeting that changed the world in a personal way. I suppose personally as a church, so I would say corporately, and I, I would love if I could do this for you, but I will instead do it with you, although certainly someone who needs to remind myself of these principles all the time in the midst of this nation we live that I love. For sometimes I think we all drop the baton and run more like Americans than Canadians in the four by one. So let's pick up the baton. What does that mean? So let me ask you the questions. I suppose, I hope, in the power of the Spirit, you're asking these of yourself. Are you surrendered? Or I suppose, if we use the language from Acts 13, are you worshiping? Not, not just how you feel on a Sunday morning, not just gathering. Is the music exactly how you like it? Is it fast enough or slow enough or loud enough or quiet enough? Not, not that. I'm not saying that's not important, but so small in comparison. Is your life fully devoted to Jesus? If not, may I ask you, beg with you, plead with you, would you surrender today? What does that mean, Pastor? It means not only believing the richness and glory of the gospel that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, rose again, conquering sin and death. Not only that you would believe in him and find forgiveness of sins, which is amazing, 
but that you would see your life as a passionate pursuit of showing how great he is. That you would live a life of surrender and worship. Well, what does that mean particularly? It means this morning, I think, this. Lord Jesus, my life is yours. If you ask me to share the gospel with our neighbors, I will. My friends, I will. My family, I will. Lord Jesus, I'm willing to accept rejection for you. It means some of you might be going to the Ukraine or Iran or you fill in the blank as missionaries for God. It means that you give up the right to your life and you say, Lord Jesus, my life is yours. Are you willing to surrender? I will say only those who know the gospel will and all who know the gospel will. Personally surrender. Secondly, passionately set. Uh, what I mean by this is let's become a church that's word saturated. We're, we're, I think, good at this. I think. But let's, let's get better. Let's listen to the Spirit. Let's, let's long to be in the Word of God. Let's long to hear His voice. Let, let's long to hear the word and hold it up as a mirror and align our lives to it. Let's, let's long to know him better and live for him more fully and with great joy. I know it's tough. I know our heroes sometimes fail us. But if we're willing in that surrender to turn to God and say, Lord Jesus, I am yours. I want to know you more. I want to hear from you more fully. I want to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I want to hear your voice and live for you. Then we will be a part of changing history. See, Acts 13, yes, it's important in terms of salvation history. Yes, it's the first missionary journey. Yes, it's unique in this. But what is not unique is this same God is choosing to fill and to use his people to impact his world for his glory. So will you take my third implication, the stick? I'm trying to find an S word for baton. Try it. Some of you as you leave this morning, will give me a better word. And I would just say to you, please do that before the sermon, not after. Will you take the baton? What do I mean by that? I mean your community, your work, your school, your friends. Jesus has chosen in his sovereignty to place you there to shine, to be salt and light. I wonder if one of the reasons why the Canadian church feels, at least to me, and certainly statistically this would be true, so weak in terms of reaching people with the gospel is because we've lost sight of the gospel and filled our minds with so many other things. Distractions, politics, positions on cultural issues. And I wonder if Acts 13 can't be, at least for this congregation and everyone who will listen to this message online, I wonder if this call can't be for us to say, we surrender. Lord Jesus, we're going to choose with our lives to be word saturated and everywhere we go, at least to the best of our abilities as those who are worshiping, we're going to start to be aware of the people you're bringing into our lives and we're going to represent you there and then through this passion for a global impact with the gospel of Jesus, we're going to continue to send, to go, to be a part of what's happening around the world. This prayer meeting, this fasting and prayer and worship service, changed the world. I'm wondering if we should realize more often that the Holy Spirit has chosen us to change this world and shape eternity. Will you surrender? Will you seek to be word saturated? Will you engage where God has placed you and around the world to accomplish his mission? The choice is yours. The impact 
global. The need, at least I believe in Canada, greater than ever before. So let's run. Let's take the baton. Let's take this seriously. Let's be a great command, great commission church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who gathered to worship you, the leaders they had. Thank you for this church family. Thank you for the global impact we have had and are having. Thank you for our missionaries. God, would you forgive us for where we have not engaged as we should personally or engaged in the wrong places? Would you free us from the world and its clutches on our hearts? And would you hear from us as individuals and corporately a willingness to be fully surrendered to you? To be those who will choose word saturation, not world acclimatization? And would you help us to live on mission for you in the world you've placed us and in the greater world by praying for and joining missionaries to accomplish what you desire? Would you, in the power of your spirit, use this text to engage our hearts, to engage our minds, and to engage our feet to accomplish what you desire? In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.